So today we're continuing on with our um, sort of introduction to high performance computing. Um, but we're going to focus mainly on serial jobs, <laughs> which is kind of funny because we spent a lot of uh, the last uh, lesson on Thursday just introducing the idea of parallel programming, parallel paradigms, and all that type of stuff. But serial does play a part in that. And so today we're going to talk about how you can get some, you're still doing things in parallel, but using, but without modifying your code, just adjusting your workflow. And also we'll do an introduction for those of you who haven't uh, used Signet. Um, I'll do sort of a mini introduction about how you actually go about using it. You know, there's a few steps that are different. It's not just one. It's not just one machine you go in and you use. There's a few steps. There's a few sort of terminology nuance. For those of you who use Signet, this is just review. You should know how to do that already. If you don't, if you have no idea, if you never used it before, pay attention. We're not really going to get into all the details you're going to need, but it should give you enough a starter that you can go into our introduction, go back through our watch one of our videos from our intro to Signet or our various tutorials online to help you sort of get up and running from the point of logging in, uh, you know, what the development nodes, what that mean, what do you do there, and how to submit a job. Okay? And then we'll also toot this in the context of how to submit a job doing serial jobs, how to frame that. And we'll also talk about a useful tool called GNU Parallel, which is a tool for uh, sort of a subscheduler for um, parallel jobs, uh, serial jobs. So, um, you know, even your desktop has many cores, and Signet, all the Signets do nodes do as well. We talked about last week the different types of clusters, uh, you know, GPUs, vector, this type of stuff. And every modern machine is a SMP system. It is multi, it's multi-cored, i.e. there are multiple processors in there. And to use all of it properly, you just can't take one serial code and it'll use 100% of the resources. That's not going to happen. Um, you need to be able to write the code in some sort of parallel or put more work on it so that it can use the whole node pro properly. So, you know, your code would run a lot faster if you could use those cores simultaneously. So, um, or you could use them on many nodes as well. And that's on a big system. That's ideally where you want. If you have a big enough problem, you need to use all of them. So we need to adjust the program accordingly. And this is where the parallel programming goes. And then there's different approaches to parallel programming, right? So um, the first one, which is not parallel programming, is just serial programming. You know, this is, it only runs on a single processor. So the individual task, one task, one launch, this is everything you run, you compile it, you run, that's what you're used to doing. Um, and you might just want to use that as is. Because ultimately, as we talked about last week, if you don't have to do parallel programming, you don't, there's no reason to go there unless you're investigating parallel programming algorithms. Um, if you have a very fast serial algorithm and does what you want, and your work data is such that it's independent, and you just need to lo do a lot of different things, then there's a reason just to stick with serial. So the problem, so if you're just doing a parameter study, like as I talked about image processing or molecular dynamics, which is relatively small, but you want to run a thousand different temperature profiles or multiple sweeps for for an optimization, you're doing 2D solutions and you want to do an optimization over all of them, then maybe it just makes more sense instead of actually speeding up that one individual task, which is already, already fairly efficient, let's just run a lot of them at the same time. And that's probably going to give you better throughput, which we talked about last week, as opposed to actually spending a lot of time doing a lot of extra hoop jumping that you may not actually benefit you. And in that, that case, this is really true with a lot of algorithms. The best serial algorithm is by far and away hardly ever the best parallel algorithm. Um, you know, things like implicit algorithms that have a lot of, you know, matrix operations and this type of things, where you need the whole global matrix or this type of information is not going to scale well in parallel because now, especially distributed parallel, because you're not going to have all that information. So you have to change the algorithm to do it well. If you're a nice, clean, explicit code and you don't have a lot of, you know, dependencies, then, then maybe that's fine. But in general, the code as you stand right now, if it's a nice optimized serial, it's not going to be optimized for parallel. Um, except if you solve, sep if your problems are completely data independent and you just work on them separately. Um, you may be running a commercial code. Maybe you're doing some bioinformatics or you're doing some, a piece of commercial software. You don't have access to the source code, so you kind of have to use it as read. It doesn't mean you can't run um, sort of in parallel. If you've got license to do it, you can run lots of the instances all the time, but you, don't, you actually can't uh, modify it. You also may be at a point, you know, you're just, you're a scientist, you just want to get your problem done. You don't want to be in the, in the, that's somebody else's thesis to paralyze this thing. That's not part of what you want to do. So if you can get away with it by just saying, okay, yeah, it takes five hours to run this code, 
and I, I know I probably can get it to go faster, but I really only need to run these 500. Well, I could just run them all in batches of, you know, a couple hundred a piece or something like that to solve my problem and not have to turn this into a big reprogramming exercise. And this is where all this comes from is know your problem, know about throughput, know data dependencies, and that will guide you which solution you may have to, to go to, right? Um, so, so we're going to talk about different ways of how to do that efficiently. So it's really not so much a programming exercise, more of a workflow exercise of analyzing what you've got and how to go about it in an efficient manner on a system that is primarily designed for large parallel workflows, which is pretty much any modern system. So let's, let's, let's take an initial situation here. You have a, a, a serial code, and the code takes a set of parameters. You know, so either it's some input from a file, preferably, or from a series of command lines that you can change. Um, and you know, it runs in a reasonably short amount of time. You're like, oh, this one image analysis takes whatever convolution, and it takes one, half an hour. Well, that's fine. But that's kind of hard. I don't want to waste sign-up resources by submitting a job for a half an hour that only takes what serial takes a whole node. That, that's really not the best way to use it. But if I have a whole bunch of these that I can batch together, say I have a large parameter space or a lot of these image files or a lot of, you know, parameters, uh, sweep of parameters that I want to adjust, then I can put a bunch of these to, into combinations and, and run them together. Um, you know, ideally, because I'm running a lots of, in this case, it's a little more complicated because if I was running one parallel job, it's pretty straightforward to track forward. You know, I submit a job, I need 100 processors, it's one job, I get one output file, that's not too hard to keep track of. But if I'm talking about doing lots of little jobs that I'm putting together, now it's a management issue. I could have hundreds, if not thousands, of these little pieces, and you know maybe one's going to fail. Maybe there's data dependencies. Maybe these ones can run first, and not these ones. So maybe uh, so the, the the feedback that you need to do around running those series of jobs is more than what you'd want to do manually. So you want to be able to automate that, preferably. So things like did the job run correctly? Where are its files? How is it's doing this type of things? Um, and all of this is, you want to do this where you want to run, run on, a, on a cluster. Um, so on, say, the sign at GPC, where you have a series of nodes. We have lots of nodes, but individually they're not very powerful, especially per core. Um, you know, we've got 30,000 cores there, but they're individually slower than your laptop. So to use them efficiently, you kind of have to structure them in a way where you're using a lot of them um, at the same time. And at a minimum, if you want, we, we, rec you know, we want the system to be used efficiently. We don't want people running serial jobs when there's eight cores. So at a minimum, you kind of have to have at least units of eight workload to, to use that system in its recommended manner. Otherwise, you're just wasting resources. Now, that's not 100% true. Like if you, our nodes only have sort of 14 gigs of memory and say your jobs need, you know, three gigs a piece. Well, we understand that. And so if you need to use, you know, six or four or something less, that, that's an acceptable use as well. However, you still have to be able to do that, that's a limitation on, on the memory, but it's still important for the workflow. So how do we go about doing this? That's sort of our, our, our problem. Um, so we, as we've, I've already mentioned, scheduling is done at sign up by node. So a node is just an individual physical computer. That's what we call a node. Um, this is just its own operating system, its own memory, its own network um, or p network connection, and eight cores. Okay, so that's the minimum unit we subdivide for the GPC. So when you submit a job, that's the minimum number of resources you're going to get. We don't, on other clusters, they backfill serial jobs or they share memory. We don't do that because we have 4,000 of them and it's just a nightmare to do that. We don't really want to do that. So if you want to run a lot of these serial processing type jobs, you kind of have to package them together. Um, so we want to use all of the processors on the nodes um, continuously. So that means if I'm packing jobs together, Ideally, they'd be equivalent size, so they'd all run 15 minutes or half an hour equivalently, or I'd have a mechanism so that it would keep, okay, this one's done, another one will start right away. We'll talk about how to do that. Um, we want to use all the memory efficiently, so if you, if you can fit eight, great. If you only use a gig a piece, you're fine, but if you use more memory, you, know, you want to make sure that's being used in a smart way. Um, you know, this, and if you're running serial codes, what this really means is you just have to have these sub-jobs. You actually have to submit into the job multiple workloads at the same time. Uh, and, and the thing we always stress is, is don't do heavy I.O. The thing with serial jobs is because you're working with lots of little jobs, you don't have a choice but to work with everyone's going to load a file, everyone's going to write a file. 
when we're doing something in large parallel, we'll get into that. One of the things we always stress is it don't do that <laughs> from every processor. Ideally, you do some sort of parallel I.O. So when you do one big job, it runs to a one big file. In a serial job, you don't have a choice. Um, so there's a couple mitigation strategies. Ideally, you know, avoid you know, generating a lot of output that you don't need. It's unnecessary. Save only what you need, especially if you're doing a large parameter study. You may only care about one number out of that. So if you're generating all these temporary files in between, you know, tell the, turn that off <laughs> or just get rid of it quickly. The other thing, too, we'll talk about is I have a slide on here about the RAM disk where you can actually use um, system memory instead of the global file system. Like, actually, not, it actually uses part of the local memory to um, run your jobs in. So if there is temporary files and you can fit in, because it's all local, it's serial, you don't need, to, need it available parallel to everybody. You just need to know it um, on that one node, then you can use that. And we'll talk about that's another strategy. If you've got a code that you can't modify or you don't have time. And you, it's also quite fast too, because it's sitting, you're using RAM like a local disk. Um, so it, it's, it's like swap space, but even faster. But you do that at the cost of, there's only you know so many gigs of memory and you do that at the cost of how much you know. We'll talk about that later. So the idea is these are sort of the, the general guidelines you have to do to, to, that we, to, to make this work well on a cluster. So, you know, and the thing is the file system is, unlike the individual nodes, which are independent, and they have their own resources, the file system is shared. That's the one consistent across everything. So if you do something bad on a node, you're doing it, you're sort of affecting everybody because there's a limited resource there. So if you do this on one node, it's probably not a big deal, but if you're doing this on 100 nodes, you're going to really slow down the system. And you guys have all probably seen it, or you will. If you're logging on the development node, you're trying to compile, and it takes a long, long, long time. Well, that's what that usually is, is a case of somebody's really hammering the file system. Our current GPC system is, has a, that is the weak point. No doubt about it. The Achilles heel is the file system. Even on more modern systems, that will hopefully be better. But it still is, in general, the part that's consistent across all these problems. And so, so uh, mitigating your I.O. strategy is, is a very large part of parameter studies is uh, avoiding how much of that excess junk you have to manage or how much is going to hit the file system. So what are your options? So I have these eight no jobs. I need to submit a job to the cluster, which we'll get into. But I, how, do I, how do I go about doing that? So um, I can, in Bash, in Shell Script, I can write a script that'll launch multiple jobs. That's fine. It's no problem. It's pretty straightforward to do. We'll, we'll go through that. Um, if you're a Python guy, you can write a Python notebook, and it'll handle sub-jobs as well as mechanisms to do that. Uh, if you're doing an R, there's ways to do that, utilities to do that. So if these are your, your main WIC, I'm not going to talk about them today because that's not my area of expertise, but we, we have um, courses and we have material about those two types um, for those specific ones. But if you just say you have an executable you want to run that's our standard compiled executable, it's probably either going to be the top one or the bottom one which is GNU Parallel, which is a sort of a, a sub-scheduler that, that helps you organize this. Instead of you having to manually write all that shell script yourself, it'll, it'll sort of give you a framework to do those launching the jobs. And we'll talk about both and, and why one might be better than the other. So let, let's, let's, let's take a diversion here right now into just the... That's our, that's our problem. That's what we want to do. I've got a bunch of serial jobs. I want to solve it. Let's see how we would, would fit that in. So we talked about this uh, last um, Thursday as well. This is our existing GPC cluster. Uh, you know, lots of nodes, uh, 16 gigs of RAM per node, 16 threads per core. You can overthread it. It's a Linux system, runs in Finiban. If you're running serial jobs, you probably don't care about this except for the file system is on it. Um, you know, it's an old system now, but it's still our main workhorse, and it's going to be around at least through um, the fall. So, and the thing, anything you do on this system, or anything the terminology you'll learn here, is going to apply to newer systems or the newer systems across Compute Canada. These are not as one-off as you think. Most of these things about modules, VEL nodes, uh, scripting, all that, that approach, it's going to apply. So even if it goes to a newer system, which is faster, and maybe the number of cores is definitely going to be higher, and there's going to be more RAM per node on a newer system, but the mechanisms are still the same. It's just like when you replace your laptop with the next one, your, your, C, your C++ code is still going to work. So a lot of this terminology, even though we're, we're focusing this around a system that is older and is going to be phased out, most of this mechanism will, will uh, apply to a newer system. So you're not learning anything that's out of date or completely out of date. So let's take a, a step back from the serial job mechanism and say, OK, I have the serial approach, but now I need to be able to run this on Cynet. Um, this is where I'm going to do a quick introduction and in how to get into Cynet. Hopefully most of you either have accounts or are working on it because you need them for your assignments. Um, so if you don't have an account, this tells you how to get it. 
Um, if you can't, you can always, the last resort usually is always to email support at Signet. That's a clearinghouse or any, it'll, we all see this email. Um, so if you have any questions, but do a little bit of due diligence yourself. Like go to the wiki page, you know, type in search, you know, RAM disk. We've got it, we've pretty much answered all those questions before. It's a wiki that's on purpose. So, so try, st always start there. But then again, if you, if you can't find something, we may just, you can always email us. That's, that's not a problem. It's just, you know, your first plus place is always to start at the wiki. That's where we, that's, that's, that's our documentation and it changes hopefully as things change on the system. Okay. So that's just the, where you, how you get an account. So now you have an account. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, sorry that white didn't turn out well, I switched the white to black, but a little bit, need to change that yellow. Um, anyway, but the, the diagram here basically shows your stages of how you want to get on the system. So the ones in yellow are the login nodes. This is the outside reachable nodes. When you log in to login.signout.utoronto.ca, that resolves to one of those four nodes. Um, it doesn't really matter, it's just that's, they're only used for logins. That's why they're called login nodes. We have multiple systems at Signet, not just the GPC. We have an old, we have a TCS, which is a power system with Blue Gene. We've got other different test systems. So we want one central access point. So we just go log in at Signet. So you have to go there first. From, you don't do anything much there, but you just go there. From there, then you go to a development node. And this is where you're going to spend most of your time. These are all called GPC 0, 1 to 8. It doesn't matter. They're all just eight of them just for pick, pick your favorite one. Um, you log in there. And you can uh, compile your codes, edit your files, submit scripts. That's where you're going to spend all your time. Okay. The guys in red are the actual compute nodes, and they have funny names like Frame 101, N001, and there's 8,000, uh, there's 3,000, 3,800 of those. But you don't have to really worry about that because you're never going to get to them directly, um, unless you submit a debug job, which I'll talk about. But you basically, you're on the devel node. You're going to submit a job. And it's going to go away to a scheduler, and it's going to go and take and run it on those nodes for you. So that's where they're non-interactive access. Okay, and we'll talk about each of those terms a little bit as I go through here. But that's the main framework. There's three types of nodes that you're going to exist on, and blue is where you're going to spend most of your time. Um, we, you have to have some sort of terminal application to get into this type of system. There's no big fancy GUI. It looks like this. <laughs> so you need. If you're on a Mac or, or a Linux box, no problem. You just open up a terminal. If you're on Windows, you can put SIGWIN or MOABXTERM. Or if you've got Windows 10, there's an Ubuntu terminal that's available built in. That's not bad either. Um, if you want to do graphics, you need that's where the dash X comes. And this will come out part of This will bring the graphics back forward. So you need to be able to have a terminal that supports that if you want. You don't have to have that, but you need some terminal to get in. So you're on your own computer. We use SSH, which stands for Secure Shell. That's how we log in. That's the only access point we have to get in. That's how you're going to move files. That's how you're going to log in. Whatever username you're given, and at login, and then that'll log you in. You end up on one of these login nodes. And you're not going to do much from there. You're just going to go to one of the development nodes. Okay? You can move files in here, too, using SFTP or SCOPY as well. That's fine. Um, if you have a lot of data, like i.e. multiple gigs of data, then we have data mover nodes. But for this class purposes, you can move files in and out just like fine, it's just using SSH, it would just be S copy. Any of your FTP clients, SFTP clients will work the same thing too. So once you've logged in, then we're going to go to a development node. So I'm logged, I'm here, then I can just either type GPC or I can go SSH GPC01, and that's going to take me to one of these guys. Now it's not going to say GPC01, it's going to say F103 and 04, because what it actually is, is we've set aside a few of those development nodes. It doesn't really matter. They're all exact, they're literally all exactly the same. Um, the development nodes have a little bit more memory and have a, uh, uh, but hardware-wise, they're exactly the same uh, in terms of processor, all that type of details. So there, that's where you're gonna you're gonna live. So here's where you're gonna do your work, okay? And you can pick your favorite one. It doesn't really matter. We just have multiple because there's lots of users. So this is where you do editing, text editor, VI, Emacs, whatever you want, Nano. Um, get used to one of those because you just want to edit lines there. You don't have to do all your stuff here. If you're used to doing it on your desktop, you could just, you know, do most of your work there and then copy it over and make minor edits. But things like getting used to an editor to be able to do um, text editing for changing little submission scripts, that type of stuff, or something you're going to want to be able to do. You're going to have to change directories, you know, submit files, that sort of stuff. So you're, so now we're here. Then um, this is where you're going to do your stuff. So your job's don't run on the login nodes or the development nodes. You don't actually, you can run short test jobs. You can go dot slash my code, and if it takes 10 seconds, nobody's going to care. But if it's bigger jobs, you're not going to be able to do that. Um, 
your jobs are on the compute nodes. So to do that, how do we get access to those? Well, there's a two different ways you can get into it. You can submit a script, which will do a non-interactive job, or you can do an interactive session, which we call a debug session. And how you interact with the queuing system is a system is a command called QSUB, so queue submission. And this can either be a file or a series of command line operations. Um, I know it looks like complicated, and this does mean something, but uh, most of the time this will be in a script that you're not going to see anyway. But all this is really saying is graphics, interactive session, a specific name for the queue, in this case a debug, and you ask, this is where you ask for what you want. This tells it, I want one node, our nodes all have processors per node equal to eight, and in this case I want two hours. The debug jobs, we set aside some nodes so that you don't have to wait in the queue. Those should almost always come back pretty quickly. So if you want a whole node to do some testing, you can do that without having to wait, you know, half a day or something. Whereas if you submit a regular job, it could take quite a while because it's a busy system. The system is overcommitted, right? So this gives you your own dedicated um, node for two hours. You don't need this for editing and compiling, but if you want to do some testing or run some, some comparisons, that you're going to want that. Um, yeah, so, so normally this is just for if you're doing testing. Normally you don't want that interactive session. You just want to submit a job to the queue, and you do this using a job script. Yeah. When, you ask for hours. when you exit, it'll just exit. You're not going to get, yeah, it's fine. It just, that's an, it's a scheduling thing. It's kind of like if I'm going to meeting with you, I set for an hour. If I'm done in 45 minutes, you can leave, and now I'm available. It will backfill another job. It's just it's a scheduling thing. That's an important point, though, because a lot of people, our maximum wall time is 48 hours, right? So people are like, well, I'm just going to always ask for 48 hours. But that may limit you from your, when your job starts, because if you ask for, you know your job only takes, say, 45 minutes. We'll ask for an hour, a little bit of buffer. But that means the scheduler will be more likely to fit you in if your time, you know, if that's all you need. If you need 48 hours, fine. But if you always set 48 hours, it's going to have to look for a node that's going to be available for quite a long time. So that's all this really is. It's not like you're going to be billed for the full time. It's just saying, I need, looking at, the scheduler is literally just a big calendar in time, right? And it just looks for availables for 3,000, you know, there's all these nodes listed with spots. And it has to stripe across them and big nodes and all this type of stuff. So it handles that for you. This is just asking for resources. So it's just a, so always you want to estimate, you want to be, you know, make sure you have enough time, but you'll figure that out as you go along. So, um, yeah, beware of read-write instructions. This is sometimes a little bit of quirk of our system is, is that your home space, when you log in, so and this is me, I'm a Northrop, I'm, you'll see it in some path. You don't really have to remember that, but if you go dollar sign home or just go CD, you'll always end up there, is here. And that's fine. This is a place where you keep your source code, it's backed up, this type of stuff, but it's not meant for running because it's on a different file system. So it's primarily there for you know, storage type space for source code and, and, and files like that. But when you want to run in the compute nodes, you actually have to run in a place called Scratch. So this is meant as temporary storage. It's a higher performance file system. Um, it, it doesn't get backed up. You have a lot more space available um, in the terabytes as opposed to like 50 gigabytes in the other one. How, and, and the way we enforce that is this is read only on the compute nodes. <laughs> so you might, it'll, you log in and you try to run from there, you'll get permission denied. And you're like, what? It's my file. I can touch it. Well, the problem is we, we literally mount it on the compute nodes uh, read only so that you can read your binary file, you can read data from it, but we don't want you writing back to it. We don't want people running in that space. And so we strictly enforce it by just, it's not available. So if you want to write output, <laughs> you don't have a choice but to run in Scratch. Okay? So you'll see our terminology throughout all our wiki, home and scratch, that's why. Um, there are other spaces too, but primarily that's, that's, that's your two spaces you're going to work from. So almost always in the front of every scratch, you're first going to say is, go to somewhere in scratch. <laughs> because you, you can run your code and copy stuff there, and then you can copy stuff back if you need to. But your home really is just for source code, Babcup, important input files. And you, it doesn't mean you can't copy it. And you do have access to it. You can see it from the compute nodes, but it's read-only. Whereas the, the everything in Scratch is read-write, okay? Because that's, on the development nodes, it is read, because of course you, it, it is read-write, because that's one thing you, you want to be able to edit and modify and compile codes, um, and so you do that in your home space on. Some people just prefer, screw it, I'm just going to do everything in Scratch, and that's fine. Just remember, there's no backups of it, so just, you're using it completely as Scratch based. So if you rm-f star, you can't, you email me, I, I can't find my file, well, it's gone. We don't, we don't have any backups of it, it's too big. Whereas there is, you know, if you did it, if you just created a file and then two seconds later deleted it, we won't have it at home, but home does have backups over time. 
So more for disaster recovery type stuff. So just be aware of that. Okay, so what's a job script? Well, a job script is just a shell script. Um, just basically, in our case, a basic bash script with a few extra stuff thrown in. So that stuff that we put on the command line to QSub, we can actually just put in the file. And this script, this file will be used twice. The first time it, it, it does, the QSub command goes through and it reads anything with hash PBS on it. That's a key code, which as far as the script is concerned is just a comment, right? Just anything with a hash is a, key, is a comment. But the, the, the queuing system goes and says, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through and read that, and it takes the information it wants about the job. So I don't have to go Q sub dash L dash Q, all the stuff, every time on the uh, command prompt. I can actually just go Q sub my job dot script, and it'll get all that information from the script. So commonly you're going to write one of these, and then you're going to copy it a thousand times. And feel free to go to our wiki and cut and paste one that works all right. Take one and then just modify it. Because most of the time all you're going to do is modify number of nodes and wall time. The other stuff, there's other options, but you don't really need to mess with them. You know, how long is the job going to take and how many nodes? PPN is always eight, and the rest of the stuff doesn't change. Now, that submits it to the job. It says, okay, it's queued. The job is queued. It's waiting to run. When it's going to run the job, then it takes this script again and it actually runs it as, an, as, a, as a bash script. So it goes hash bash. It skips over that section because it doesn't mean anything. It's a comment. Then it just runs it just as if you were a series of commands running on the command prompt. Goes to there, we have this directory PBSO work directory, which is really just a shortcut to the directory you were last in. As you know, when you log in, it always goes to home by default. This will take you to wherever you submitted the job from. You don't have to use it. We, I find it useful because then I don't have to remember changing the path or scratch my directory slash b slash now, whatever. Uh, this will just take you for. Then you run your code and do anything else. And then it'll run. When, the, when this final line exits, like it finishes this and exits, if it's been 43 minutes, the code will just exit. And the queuing system says, oh, you're done. And then it just kicks you out. <laughs> and you'll get a couple .e and .o files that, that are your redirected standard out standard. Anything you normally would get on the command line, uh, like you know normal display messages, you'll get them in those files. Plus some information about your job. Okay. So it says that it normally starts in your home directory, but that's why we have the PBSO work directory. And then also in this place, you also do say you load modules. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think it's about two minutes, and it'll kill your job. So it'll say job terminate wall time exited or something, and you'll get an email. It'll tell you. It'll, you usually get an email when it, it when the job by default when the job exits cleanly, you won't get an email. It'll just say, you can change that option. There's mail options. Like, say you want that, you can. But if a job aborts, i.e. it hits a limit or something like that, you'll get an email saying, job exceeded wall time or something like that. And then you'll see the same error. It'll just kill. It's just like going kill-9. It'll just kill your job. There's like a two-minute grace period there, basically. But effectively, it'll just kill your job. Yeah, 48 hours. That's a hard limit across anything. So if jobs, if you need 49, you need to restart in your code. And if you're running two days without a restart, you're rolling dice anyway. Because if the job dies at 47 hours, you just wasted a lot of our resources. So that's why we, we, you really want, in any long code, or if you're doing a large workload, you ha want a checkpoint restart in your code. Some way of, you run so long, it saves an input file, and then it has to be able to restart itself. Because that way, if you need, if you have restart capability, you can run effectively infinitely long. We can even have scripts that'll submit another script. So say that job is going to take me three weeks. Well, that's fine. I set it as a series of 24-hour jobs that depend on each other, and I just keep restarting. And the important part about that is if I lose one job and it, I can restart from my old solution, I don't waste a week worth of simulation. I might, okay, I'll waste a few hours. But that's why we, 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 we kind of strictly do that. What it also does is allows high turnover in the queue. If we allowed people to submit month-long jobs, you'd be waiting for a long time to get your jobs in because you, you, know, you get in and you're good, but then otherwise there's no turnover. So this, this helps with a lot of structural usages. Yeah. Rather than setting up maybe a, a, like a two-week job, you can set up a bunch of half-hour jobs or something like that. Or yeah, so there's always a happy medium. You know, there's overhead with restarting jobs. But yeah, if you, if you have, if you, so instead of a week, say a week-long job, instead of submitting, you know, you can actually put seven 24-hour jobs in and you make them all dependent on each other. There's something called dependencies and then you just submit them and it'll, it'll keep the six queued and then it'll say when this one's six successful, then it launches the next one. I mean, okay, so I guess the benefit of maybe doing like the shorter jobs would be that they could pass, yeah. right? 
Yeah, they can to a point. So backfill, as I said, but there's overhead with starting and stopping jobs too. If you have a half an hour job and it takes you seven minutes to read your input, now you're super inefficient, right? Whereas if it's if it's a ten hour job, seven minutes, who cares, right? It's 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 that sort of thing, right? So don't game the system too much. We'll get. Yeah, you share the development nodes. They're all shared. Yeah. There are eight cores. There are eight nodes with eight cores each. So most of the time on the development node, you're editing a file, right? You're, you're compiling or something. So the load, you can see it. Sometimes they get busy, but it's, it's usually not too bad. If you are worried about it, you can get it. But they're just shared. Because you're not supposed to be doing heavy work on them, right? You're supposed to just be editing files and doing a quick compilation or you know that sort of thing. So most of the work, it's kind of like very lightweight. So it is. You'll do, when you log in and type, say, W or who, you'll see like 20 people that's logged in there. That's fine. Okay, so that's the main main points of of the job script. Um, yeah, so here's just sort of a process of my normal work a day example here, where I logged into the development node. I want to compile some C++ code. I do it on the command file. Then I say, okay, I built my code. Now I copy it to the scratch directory. I go there. Now I'm going to edit a file, and I'm going to write a little quick. Um, example, this is a serial code, so it's just a, I'm going to ask for one node for one hour, and I'm going to go work directory, run my code. Then what I do is I submit it, so then I've called that file submission, so now I don't have to put all that details, I just go Q sub submission, sends it away, I'll get a job ID that I don't have to remember. <laughs> there's ways you don't have to remember, it's just some, it's a unique ID number, but if, there's, if you type Q stat, you can see it. So in this case here, you go Q stat dash user Northrop, or show Q, and you'll see your job. It's all fine. It's sitting there. It's just queued. So this will either be Q, R, or C, running or canceled. And that's fine. Most of the time it's going to be queued. When it's running, you're running. You should be able to see output from that. Then I, when the job is done, I will get my output.txt, which comes from this file, and two other files, which are the name of the job with .e, .o, and the job ID. Those are your standard out and standard um, error. So if there's any, this one normally will be empty if nothing went wrong. This one will have some information. Anything you output it to the screen normally would show up in that file unless you redirect in here. And you only see those after your job is done. Okay? So you're, so you're like, where, where, where are those files that just suddenly appear? Well, it, it gets staged on the compute node. So you only see them in your local directory when the job is finished. So if you want to see stuff while it's running, you want to redirect your output while you're running. Say you have, you know, dot, dot, dot or something like that. You can do that. Okay? These are useful for debugging. These will this will tell you kill job in that one. <laughs> this will tell you it'll tell you which node it was running on if there's any problems. So don't automatically delete them right away. Um, this will this will tell you information if there's something went wrong with your code, or if you can't find a file or something dumb. It'll tell you that right away. Okay, so that's the sort of that's the general high level things just for a serial code, right? Or just yeah. so, for, so once we get this output file, you said that like writing is kind of a temporary thing, so you have. Okay, so when you, if you're writing in Scratch, that's not, that's, that's temporary in the sense that it's good for three months. <laughs> it's, wow. it's not going to disappear. It's a real file system backed up, with, I mean, not backed up, but it actually is rated and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's a, a live file system. It just means we don't store it. So if you need that data and you want to keep it, you need to archive it or pull it back to your system. But it's, it's temporary in the, we have a fairly graceful period of, of three months or something, right? But it's a working space. Think about that. Okay. So that's the sort of general high-level pieces. You know, login node, development node, submitting a job. That's there. This would be the same thing if it was a parallel job. If it was threaded, you would just have OMP num threads equals X in the number of threads. If it was parallel, you'd go MPI run dash NP twenty five or whatever and launch that. And we'll we'll you'll see examples of that in the next few classes. But in this case, we just have a serial code, so it's just like you would run it. But this one is inefficient because we're only running one serial on a node that could do eight. That's fine for testing, but we don't want to do that in general because we're only using 12% of that node, right? So this is this, this, that wasn't enough to you know, answer all your questions, but it, it should you know, give you the, the main uh, gist of it, and you'll be able to go through the wiki or the, the more comprehensive introduction stuff to fill out all your questions to which flags and all stuff you need to use. Um, you know, if you haven't taken the intro to Cynet, we recommend you do that. We do that once a month, um, usually once a month. I think it's still 
So, you, so definitely do that. It, there's, it's sort of like mm, 60 minutes to 90 minutes, and it'll walk you through all these steps, plus the file systems, plus all the details. So definitely, if you're going to be using Sonnet regularly, you want to start there. Um, and there's all the stuff's on the wiki, and you know, if you get stuck in a question, you can always email us. And Marcella will answer. Got a volunteer. <laughs> he loves newbie questions, right? <laughs> They're easy, right? <laughs> um, so let's go back. So that's the sort of the general encapsulation of how we'd run any job on Synet. So now let's go back to our specific case where I've got a bunch of serial jobs. And I want to run them efficiently. So here's one way to do it. We talked about we could just use a shell script. So there's, a, there's within shell scripting bash language, there's a way to run launch multiple things and not just wait. So if you do our same script here, but you go, okay, go to some job directory, run this code, and if you use the ampersand, that'll put it in the background. So that means it'll go, okay, go on and then keep going. It won't stop and wait for that line of execution. So that means, okay, start one job, go to the next one, start a next job, go to the next one. So I can actually launch multiple jobs. I can do an infinite number of those and overload the node. But it allows me to launch a lot of things without having to wait in a serial fashion. Yeah. In this case, you are, but they're in different directories. So I say, say, say I pre-staged eight directories with different input files. Say I read in, you know, ideally there would be a command line option and you'd put in one, two, three, four, whatever you want. But say I, this is the way my code's written. It reads a file called in.out and I go and I put the numbers one, two, three, four, five. They're running in different directories, so or they theoretically could be the same, but ideally they'd be different, right? But this, that's just, this is a, a reference idea. So that's what we'll go with that. So we're running the same binary, but we're running a parameter study. So we just, we're changing the input parameters. Um, and then the output will be staged in those directories. Now, this works perfectly fine. A few caveats, though. Um, be very careful with this statement. <laughs> if you don't use wait at the end, this will run, 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 bang, and then it'll kill your job. <laughs> because you've already told it to background everything. And so then it exits the script, and the and this queuing system says, oh, you're done. And then it just goes and comes in with a, with a kill dash nine and kills everything. And you're like, I, nothing ran. Whereas this wait statement will track those, those, those spawned processes, right? So just be careful. This is important if you're using ampersands in this way. Um, yeah. You could, you could, the, the danger is if you don't, what happens is if these are not all going to be finishing at the same time, then you may get a disproportionate. Say this one was still running, and you, and this one, you're waiting on this last guy. If this guy's not the longest, it's not going to wait on all of them, right? That would only work if this, if they were exactly all the same, or this guy's the longest. So it's a little dangerous. So this is a more okay. structural way of checking anything spawns from a child processes things. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused. But what's the extension of this file? Is it a make file or what? Kind of a... Doesn't matter. It's a text file. You can call it .sh .sh .script. Okay. Mime types don't matter in Unix. That's convention. It's like. We don't have to. We could call this mycode.exe if you're of that generation, but right. it doesn't. A lot of people call them .script, .sh, because it's a bash script. Right. See, the very anything you're not used to this con context at the very top, it goes hash bang bin bash. That tells you the language you're using. When you're logged in on our terminal, that's what you're speaking. So we like to use bash. You don't have to. That could be Python. <laughs> that could be you know T shell if you're ancient. Or it could be C shell or Z shell if you're really weird. But there's there's many there's many different languages, and that's all it really is. Just that's just telling it. Stick to Bash. Just that's the that's way more common than anything else nowadays, and you won't look like a fossil or something running around with your C shell. Um, but some scripts are C shell, and that's fine too. It's just the le the syntax changes, right? It's like running Python versus R. It's just going to have slightly different syntax. So you make it something dot sh or something. Okay. That, that, that's sort of a typical convention, right? Because bash is just born again shell. It's just a newer version of the, of course, we don't need to go down with all those conventions. But anyway, um, yeah, so it's just a text file. Okay, so this is, this does work. But, you know, the problem is, is, as we already alluded to, if these are not all, if these are all just a parameter study and they're all doing a thousand iterations, this is fine because they're all going to run, and I'm going to use all eight processors almost all exactly the same at time. But what happens if these workloads are slightly different? I don't know how long they're going to do. This one's going to run for 10 minutes, but these ones are only going to run for one minute. Well, now I'm wasting most of my, pro my system quite a lot of time, right? And it, it's messy, so we should, we should find a better way to do that. Um, you could roll your own. 
If you really are a bash script kitty and you're like, ah, I can just script out anything, you can. You can write yourself a little function that will launch each of these variable time codes, which will wait and then shift them through to make sure it runs. You can do this. I wouldn't, because <laughs> now you're sort of reinventing the weird wheel here. And you're not really putting in job control. You're kind of just doing a brute force auto launch where this one's done, start another one. This one launch, start another one. You know, there's no fault tolerance. If this one happens to die and throws an error or seg faults or something, you may kill all the other ones. It's just, it is not as thorough as you may want to be. And you can, you can only do this on one, one node. There's no support for multi-node jobs. So you're like, well, this is the type of thing somebody, you think somebody would have writ written something. Well, the answer is, well, they have. <laughs> this is where New Parallel comes around. Um, and this does say New Parallel, but it's black, so you can't see it. So we just get this nice little, I don't know, that's their diagram. I should have put it on weight, I guess. You can't see it at all there. Anyway, um, but basically it's just a script, but you're going to use it as a utility that does all this stuff for you. You know, it's uh, versatile, lots of options. There's a million flags, just like any good Linux utility. There's a million more flags than you're not going to know about. It's simple to use. You literally, you'll see in the examples, you just go parallel, number of threads I want, and give it a list of options, and it'll handle all the rest for you. So you don't have to remember, no, be, a, be a, a script kitty to figure out all the details of that when you can just you know, get it sorted out by using the tools that are there for you. So here's a simple example. Um, same idea, we're just going to load module new parallel. I'm going to have just a list of those jobs that I would have before, but instead of ampersanding them in each, I'm just basically reading them from a file. I could have them pre-staged in a file, or what this means is just I'm going to just read everything from this section, from this section, into a new file. And I'm just going to feed them into parallel. That's the tool, GNU Parallel. Dash J just means there's eight cores on this machine, so lot eight at a time. What New Parallel is going to do is it's going to take them line by line. It's going to say, okay, start, 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 start until it gets to eight. And then it's going to wait. And it's going to say, oh, okay, I'm at eight. Eight are running. And periodically it says, oh, now three is done. Okay, I've got one more slot. Chun -chun. It'll automatically pick the next one. And it'll just go through, but it'll keep eight running at all time until it gets up to all, they're all done. Right? So that's, that's kind of what you want, right? It's, it's, it's keeping that load balance running. Um, if you can't keep eight, say you don't have their bigger memory, you can reduce that to dash J6 or Josh J4. That's fine too. It just You are telling it, you're controlling it how many you're, you're going to run. Um, and you can all, you just put all the commands on each single line. It can teach each single line as a job. Um, but what else? They're like, well, I could do that with my shell script. What else does it do for me? Well, um, it assigns those new sub, it, it keeps the, the load um, busy. So if you have 64 jobs and eight processors, yeah, you might run eight at a time, but you might run, you might run some jobs faster and slower. So it'll sort of keep that backfill. So that should run faster overall than if you were just running them eight at a time. Um, you can uh, you can you could overload it with hyperthreading. You can use that as well as if you want to do that. Um, you can use across multiple nodes. There's a flags in here where you can tell it because I launch three jobs and I say I've got a thousand input parameters. I could actually launch over ten jobs and it'll do across all those. Now in our system, it's usually not really worth doing that. It's to split them up into different jobs, but you have the option here to do that as well. Um, the nice thing it actually also too is you can log a record of each subjob. So it'll tell you when it started, when it stopped, give you some nice metadata so you can track, you know, um, issues that happen with those jobs. It also has a mechanism too where you can restart a job. So say you have 100 in that file and it, you didn't put in long enough time and it died on line 72. Crap, now I've got to go either re reprogram it or restart it. But if you log that data, you can actually get it to restart. Um, and do the last little bit without actually having to go through all the whole ones again or re reconfiguring your input file. So without GNU Parallel, if I just launched eight at a time, I'm always going to be limited by whoever my longest job is. And this is all the black is wasted time. So in this example, it took 17 hours and I'm wasting a good chunk of my utilization. Whereas in this case, because I'm always running eight, the scheduler is just, you know, I'm still going to have some inefficiencies because when this one started, I'm still backfilling a little bit here. I mean, I'm wasted time, but it, I'm still getting much better utilization because GNU Parallel is always keeping something running. It doesn't know a priori you know, which, which job is, how long it's going to take, but at least it's keeping eight running at all the time. So if you happen to have one job that started, you know, this processor ends up only seeing three, this guy sees two, this one sees five though, right? In its lifetime. Hey, we don't care, but it, it keeps it busy. Whereas all these guys only see one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, regardless of how many, you know, 
how long it takes. So you don't. You can be a little less if you're not sure about your workload length. And you, then this is. If they are all the same length, it's not going to hurt either. But this actually does help you. You don't have to be knowing exactly how long every job is going to take. So another example of this is just doing it within a file. So we can just create a file with all our command logs, just a series of things that we want to run. So you know, one to twenty-eight, we create that file, um, and then I, I can just push them into this parallel command in our regular um, script. The only differences we're adding into is the load new parallel. We have some working directory where this file is that we're going to start from. Inside that, we're going to go to different directories. We can control it any way we want. Um, the no run empty just says you're allowed spaces in this file. It's just There's a million options. That's just a nice one for that. But as I said, it's much simpler, and you don't have to be very up on all. You, you know, you got to know a few flags. But you can get up and running quicker and, and have all, all this done uh, using their pre-written uh, script details as opposed to you having to reinvent the wheel for that. So there's a few flags. Dash jobs is the same as dash j. That's really the most common one you're going to use. Just how many how many of these are going to launch at a time. You can log it. I mentioned this before. If you log it, then using that log file, you'll get all the details of what's running, and you can also restart it using this resume option. So that's useful, especially if you've got a short number. It's not a big deal. But if you've got a lot in there, or you're dealing with a lot of parameters, then that's when you excuse me you're going to want to use. Uh, pipe splits uh, the standard in as well too. It sometimes can be useful if you need to put a different input in. As I said, there's lots of options. The main one you want to know about is jobs. And then you can look up the details for all the, all, if you want examples and stuff. And once again, on the wiki, we actually have, our MCS has done a pretty good presentation on, dedicated to this, and there's also details for that too. So these are just trying to get you different ideas of how you can um, run through. So you can also do in multi-nodes. Um, all you're really doing that one is you kind of make it emulate what an MPI does, where you use our PBS node file, which is a list of, I mean, one node, it's always just the self, but this has a list of all the nodes you've asked for, and then you just add SSH log file, and what this is going to do in this is it's going to, uh, now I'm going to launch eight in this case, but I'm going to spread them across up to five nodes, um, so five on each or whatever, or eight on each, and um, it can do that across multiple nodes. So if you want to do really large processing, you know, where eight's not going to be enough and you have thousands, you can do this. Uh, you could also just launch five jobs, each with their own list as well. And then they're completely independent. It's up to you. But sometimes there's reasons to keep it all together, right? Anyway, these are, details aren't that important. It's just it, 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 there is a way to do all this across. It's just you have to be more careful in this case because now um, if, you're, if you're sharing data files, they're going to be on separate nodes. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of specialized options, modify arguments, specialized ways of formatting output. Um, there's a man page and, and full details on the wiki. Um, I don't want to get, I'm not an expert in this, but I don't. That's the main points, just to get the idea of there are, if you are going to be doing serial processing or batch processing, uh, we highly recommend you use New Parallel. Because even if it's simple to start and you want to do some fancier stuff, uh, you're already set up to do that. Um, one last thing I wanted to sort of stick in here, as I did mention, there's this idea of RAM disk to help with uh, uh, local I.O. What this RAM disk is, is just it really just mounts something called dev shmem, which is really just a pointer back into your own memory that looks like a file system. So you go ls dev shmem and you type edit and modify POSIX files just like you normally would, but it's actually in your memory. It's, your, it's using system memory. So A, it's really fast, it's local, Problem is it's limited. If you only have 16 gigs of memory, that's as much as available. So on these systems, you can use about 70% of it, but it's not free. You're doing you're doing it at the cost of your code. So if you need one gig per core of regular memory for your running code plus the operating system, you're not going to have 11 gigs left. You're going to have you know, uh, say it's 14 gigs available. You're going to have you know, uh, six gigs or something you can use. Okay, but how you would do that is you do what's called stage in, stage out. So it's the same sort of idea. You make a directory in there. You copy your files from PBSO work directory, which is probably on Scratch. So now instead of working on Scratch, then you go directory, run what you want to do in there, hammer the file system independent of Scratch. You're not hitting the Scratch file system. We can't yell at you for doing 10,000 IOPS because it's all local. Uh, benefits of that is you're not affecting the global system, and it's probably way more performant if you're doing a lot of little tiny file operations. Uh, downsize it has to be able to fit in that memory, and if this crashes and we kick you out, it's gone. <laughs> Any data, if you don't get to this stage where you finish and copy out the data, 
where you're not going to get it back because it gets wiped once you get kicked out of the node. So it's really temporary storage. So unlike the scratch, which is kind of you know, three-month storage, this is only as persists as long as the job exists. So you probably even more want to be very careful about your, your error checking. And if there's an error, copy out your data, then exit, not just wait for an error and then just die. So you, or be careful of your time and that sort of thing. But it can be very beneficial as a workaround. As I said, just think of it as a local hard drive, but it's just it's sitting in memory. Does that make sense? I mean, ideally, you wouldn't have to do this, but it's a quick workaround for, we found it useful in some cases. It just, a lot of these codes, especially serial codes, do a lot of bad things with file. <laughs> and, or if you have a database, sometimes this is a quicker way of staging the database in as well, too. So it's there. You might as well use it. So just in summary, um, you know, be aware of the features in your code and where you want to run it. You're going to tailor your workload to the environment you're going to run it on. The GPC, that means eight cores and 16 gigs of RAM. So on one of the newer systems, there's going to be a lot more cores and a lot more memory. So you're going to have to stage it differently that way as well, too. Um, you know, if you're going to run serial jobs, we want to, you've got to use the nodes efficiently. So think in batches of eight or run par or new parallel in batches of 100. Um, and also, New Parallel is really good, too, in the sense of you don't know how long the job there. You can actually just pick a good chunk of time, say 10 hours, and give it 100, and it'll backfill that and use the system without having to restart new jobs each time. Um, you know, don't write your own serial management. Use GNU Parallel. Um, and, you know, the RAM disk is available. If, you, it's the first, if you're doing a lot of low I.O., the first thing to look at is, hey, can I, do I need to do it? But if you still need to do it or you can't change it, if you'll fit into RAM disk, and the very last thing is, is do it off of the regular scratch space if you don't have a choice. Um, but those are the sort of the, we're all just kind of, all this mechanism is to get thinking about parallel. And this is workload in parallel. It's not parallel programming per se, but it's definitely thinking in parallel because now you're doing data parallel work and finding out dependencies. So if you're, if you're at this point, then you're at great. I don't need to do anything more. Uh, the next steps, the next two lessons will go into now how to thread it. So now, okay, my code is slower. I need to speed it up or I want to, want to use it in a parallel math fashion, now we're actually going to get into the code and teach details of parallel programming. First, with threads, then with MPI or distributed memory parallel programming, and the two most common ways of that. Okay? Um, any questions? Yeah? So several processors, I mean several nodes, or... One node with eight cores. Yeah, you can do this. This will work. You need if you're using GNU in parallel, we've got a module for that. But it's not it's not Cynet specific. That's you can get that in other places. So if you're working on SharkNet or one of the other systems, you can this any of those shell script approaches will work. It's just you're just they're all multi-node systems. So some have twelve, some have sixteen. So you gotta you gotta tailor it to that. So that, is time to that. Yeah. Right. So I can, I can use it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, New Parallel is a, we have the, the reference, just type of Google search New Parallel or even, you know, AppGet or whatever it's if you want. Easy. It's it's just, a, it really is not much more than a, a shell script, right? So it's a tool just like anything else you can use available. And if it's not, it was on a cluster. So say if you have a four core laptop or desktop, you can use that fine too. Yeah. Because once again, this is the shell script. This you can ignore. This is staging. So you can run this just on your, this part. That's all you need to do. This is not, it's not, it's not scientific specific. We, we hate to do anything. It's too specific. It, this, the whole point is these tools should be available. 